Well, hey, praise the Lord. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Line by Line podcast. Once again, coming to you with a Bible study for your soul. We pray that all is well with you on this night. Uh, we are streaming right now live over Facebook and YouTube, Periscope, Twitter, and Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. You go there, you'll find all the podcasts that the Lord has graced us to be able to produce over the years. Amen. You can also go to our website at that's the word.org. Uh, there you'll also find our websites and you can also go to our contact page, leave us your email address and we'll send you a copy of our, of our newsletter, letting you know what's going on in the ministry. Amen. You can also, while you're there, you can go to our, to our, excuse me. Uh, you can also go uh, to our resource page and download a copy of our ebook entitled Remaining Unmovable, Seven uh, Keys to Quality Longevity in Christ. Amen. So once again, we pray uh, that this particular resource will be a help uh, to your life. It is a free download. Also, uh, there's also on our website, uh, there's a link that will take you to our to Amazon where you can purchase, if you so desire, a copy of our book uh, entitled um, the lights in the windows, eight basic and powerful principles on evangelism. Amen. So once again, these, these resources are uh, designed to help you in your Christian life. Amen. Well, tonight we are continuing, uh, in our line by line, uh, Bible study in the book of first Thessalonians. We have reached the final chapter. That is chapter number five. Uh, not sure whether we'll finish chapter five, uh, all tonight, uh, we're not in a rush, uh, but once again, we're taking it one verse at a time. We want clarity and we want to hear the Lord speak concerning his word. Amen. And so if you are watching right now on Facebook, uh, you can share this page uh, that others also may be blessed. We always, always, uh, want to make sure that as many people as possible are able to hear, uh, this life changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so that's why we here, we want to spread the gospel. Amen. So we're going to pray and we're going to get right into this study uh, for tonight. Amen. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for giving us uh, this opportunity to open up your word. Uh, Lord, we know uh, that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish the purpose that it was sent out for. So Lord, we pray that you will speak to the heart to are under the sound of your word uh, this evening, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know uh, that your word reaches. And Lord, we know that your word will accomplish. So Lord, have your way. Bless us together even right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless the name of the Lord. Well, we are in First Thessalonians chapter number 5. First Thessalonians chapter number 5. Amen. Now, let me just give you this note here. Uh, as we get into chapter number 5, uh, he is continuing, uh, Paul is continuing uh, pretty much where he left off uh, in chapter number four. Remember that these are letters that were written by Paul the Apostle. This is a letter, and and the chapters were put in much, much later. And so sometimes uh, the flow of a thought or a conversation or something that the writer is speaking about Sometimes it seems that it could go in the previous chapter, and this is one of those times. It, it it would seem, as we read, that many of the things that he begins to talk about here could be grouped in with chapter uh, number four. But as it is, we see the chapter, uh, the chapter cut off, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. But here he is continuing uh, his dialogue uh, on end time events which are very, very uh, important. So let's go here to verse number one, 1 Thessalonians chapter number five. He says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And so here he's going, he's getting ready to get into a discussion of the day of the Lord. We'll explain what that's all about in just a moment. Uh, but he says, listen, of uh, concerning concerning the times and the seasons, concerning future events, uh, there is not much that I need to tell you. Uh, in chapter number four, in chapter number four, he was writing about things uh, that they didn't know about because he says 
uh, he says in verse number 13 of chapter number four, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant of this. So he's, he's telling them in chapter number four at the end of the chapter, he's telling them some things that they may have not been aware of. Remember, uh, when he began, uh, when he began, uh, he was saying that, the, uh, uh, that, uh, that these things are going to take place. They are going to take place. But once again, as he's speaking, the Holy Spirit is guiding him. And so many of the things that Paul the Apostle wrote, no one had heard before. He was bringing clarity. Remember we said last week, uh, when Jesus spoke about the rapture, it was in very veiled terms. It, we, we don't even see the word rapture in scripture uh, spoken by Jesus or by Paul. But when Jesus says, I will come again and uh, I am preparing a place. And when I come again, I will take you and receive you to myself. That was a veiled reference to uh, the rapture. When Jesus will come in the air to take us away. Here in chapter number four, Paul expounds upon what Jesus said and tells us exactly how it, would all, how it would all take place. God bless you, my sister Debbie. God bless you. But here in chapter number five, he continues with this discussion and he says of the times and, and season as he's beginning, as he's about to introduce uh, the furtherance of this subject, he says, there's no need uh, that I, I, there's no, uh, I don't need to tell you about uh, these things. And the questions that many people had is, listen, how long before Christ comes? Uh, and at what point in history will he come? Here's a fact uh, that uh, each season, or rather each part of history, Christians have believed that Christ would come. During World War II, people thought that Christ would come at that particular time. There's going to be a world war all of the nations are rising up against one another. And I am sure uh, that those who are Christians, those who are in tune with prophetic events in those days, uh, they were thinking that maybe this would be the time. Uh, I can remember I can remember uh, uh, several years ago, I believe when I was in high school, there was some sort of conflict in the Mideast that I can't quite remember right now. Uh, but it was I can remember thinking in my mind, is this the end? Because the, the nation's... Uh, 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 are rising up against one another and 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 declaring war and and it's not safe and is this the end and and every generation uh, has its times where they think it's the end and we are also living in a time where we too believe that the coming of Christ is imminent that means it could happen at any time and and I do believe now more than ever uh the times and the things that have been taking place uh, leave this world ready for the coming of the Lord. Amen. Now, once again, as I before I get into chapter number two, a uh, verse number two rather, and start talking about the day of the Lord, let me just say uh, that when we talk about the rapture, we talk about the coming of the Lord. Uh, the coming of the Lord happens in two phases. It happens in two phases. Now, as we've just said, the rapture can take place at any time, at any moment, uh, when the Lord will come in the sky. And as we read last week in chapter number four, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is one event. That is phase one of the second coming. Seven years later, approximately seven years later, uh, after what the Bible calls tribulation and the great tribulation, Christ will come to earth. He will come. How will he come? He will come from heaven with all of us who went up seven years previously. We will all come back. And when we come back, uh, it will be uh, for the sole purpose, for one of the sole purposes is to rescue Israel. The nations of the world will rise up against Israel uh, through the auspices of the Antichrist, and they will be ready to take over and destroy Israel. But Jesus will intervene, and we will be with him when he does this. At that time, when he defeats the nations of the world, he will begin to set up his millennial kingdom. 
the millennial kingdom, which will last for 1,000 years. That's what we call it, the millennial kingdom, the millennium. Uh, so all of this is part of what Paul is going to talk about here in verse number two briefly, the day of the Lord. Verse number two, he says, for yourselves know. Remember we said previously, he didn't want them to be ignorant about some things, but now he says, this is some of what I'm talking about now. You, you know what I'm speaking about. Uh, and he says, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. That means that it's going to come unexpectedly. Now, this also describes the rapture. He is not here talking about the rapture in particular, though the rapture will take on though that particular characteristic. It will come unexpectedly. Now, for the child of God, as he's going to get into in these verses, uh, we should not be caught by surprise because we are looking for the coming of the Lord. We are expecting him. We are waiting for him. Uh, here, he says, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is a phrase that we find several times in the Old Testament, many, many times in the Old Testament, and every time, and, and several times in the New Testament also. And what makes the day of the Lord what it is called is that it's always involving judgment of some kind. The Lord is going to bring judgment during this time. This day of the Lord that he's speaking about here is the, the days uh, of the time immediately following the rapture when the church is gone, when we will be with the Lord, amen? And that will usher in the great tribulation. The first three and a half years of the seven would uh, typically is called tribulation. It's going to be hard times. You have to go through the book of Revelation to make any sense of it all, the different things are that are going to be taking place prophetically. But when we come to the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation, things will begin to change drastically, drastically, because the man known as the Antichrist, and no one knows who, who he is at this time, we have no idea who he is, and every child of God right now, we who are alive right now, we will never know who he is while we're here on earth because the Antichrist cannot be revealed. He cannot come. He cannot be exposed until the church is gone. Amen? So don't worry your mind trying to figure out who's the Antichrist and is this person the Antichrist? This man is so bad. He's so, he's so evil. He is the... We don't know who the Antichrist is and as children of God, you will never know. You will never know, except from heaven. And, and there's no clue in heaven that we're going to be looking down on earth. And that is not what's going to be happening. So don't worry about who the Antichrist is. Just know that he can't come while you're here. Amen? That's very important to remember. And so when he's talking about the day of the Lord, it's speaking about this time of judgment. The great tribulation is a time of judgment on Israel in particular. And the world in general, it is how the Lord, it is what the Lord will use to bring Israel back to him. Remember, the tribulation is the time in which the Lord will use to bring Israel back to him. That's what the great tribulation is all about. Uh, the Bible talks about this individual who will be called who will uh, biblically is called the Antichrist, uh, will come as a friend. Uh, he will come as someone who Israel will admire and they will embrace. And he will make some sort of treaty. He will bring peace. He will bring, he will bring peace between Israel and, and their enemies in the Mideast. He will bring peace. No one has been able to do that up to now. No one. Don't worry about any peace treaty that you may see uh, in the news. Over the years, we've seen many, and, and they're broken by both sides from time to time. Listen, don't worry about any peace treaty. There will be no true peace, of course, until Jesus comes. But the peace that the Antichrist will broker will be a diabolical peace because he's doing it, and he, he's doing it for an ulterior motive. 
Okay, this man, the Antichrist, whomever he is, he will be energized by Satan himself. Energized by Satan himself. And so he will be a very, very, biblically speaking, he will be a very, very shrewd individual. Amen? Politically inclined, whether he will be a political uh, person or not, but he will be politically inclined because he will have to deal with nations. Okay? And so the day of the Lord will usher in this time. Once again, following that first three and a half years, when he will break that treaty, he will break the treaty that he made and, and, and he will turn on Israel and Israel will realize that they have been bamboozled. <laughs> they will realize that they have been hoodwinked and it will set the stage, it will open up the door for terrible uh, a, a terrible uh, things that will continue to happen. Now, we said that this uh, the purpose of the Great Tribulation is for the children of Israel mainly, but the entire world, the entire world uh, will be a part of what is going on because the things that will be taking place on the planet, I'm talking about I'm talking about things happening in the skies. I'm talking about things happening on earth. I'm talking about things happening in the oceans and the seas and the lakes. All of these different things will have a will have a great effect on the entire population of the planet. Economically, it's going to be a very very difficult time and the book of Revelation speaks to all of these things. Amen. And so once again, he says in verse number 2, you know that the day of the Lord it, it, it will come as a thief in the night. And that is that moment that Christ will crack through the skies and rescue Israel, delivering them and ushering in uh, the millennial kingdom. Verse number three, he says, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. That word they, is in this verse twice. That lets us know that it's not talking about you. Notice when he's talking about the child of God. Notice when he's talking about his Christian brethren. He says, brethren. He says in verse number two, you yourselves know. That's who he's writing to. That's his audience. Uh, but here in verse number three, he says, for when they, he didn't say for when you, so when they shall say peace and safety. You see, uh, during this time, uh, during this time, uh, the world, just as the world has been, but it will be increased, uh, the world will be absorbed in itself. The world will be absorbed in all the cares of this world. Uh, and it behooves, let me use that word behooves, it behooves each and every one of us as Christians not to allow ourselves to become absorbed in this world system. Because there is no peace here. There is no security here. There is no true assurance here. So we must not put our eggs in the basket of the world. The world has nothing to offer us. We must keep our eyes on the skies. Amen? Keep our eyes on the skies. Let me put it in the way that an old song that we used to sing uh, years ago. Keep your eyes on the prize for your home in the skies. Amen? God is on the throne, and we need to keep our eyes right there. Amen? Now, this, the fact that they're talking about peace and safety, that will be characteristic of the world, but more so, it will be characteristic of Israel. Israel will say, this, this, this man, uh, this powerful man has brought peace. He has brought peace to the world. What else can we ask for? All these years, I'm talking about religious Israel now, religious Israel has been still awaiting their Messiah. There, we know that there are different sects and different factions in, uh, in uh, Judaism, but they have been looking uh, for their Messiah. Certain individuals, uh, I live in an area, uh, I can remember seeing uh, signs that uh, the Messiah has come. Uh, not too many uh, not too far from where I live, there's a there was used to be a poster that says uh, the Messiah has come. Come and listen to him. And he was an Hasidic Jew with the the black hat and the black uh, the black clothes and the and the long white beard. And they were calling this man the Messiah. Have no idea what his name was. This was several years back. But they're still looking for their Messiah. But when the Antichrist comes, Israel uh, uh, 
will pretty much believe that he is it because of what he does and how he does it. They will be they will be totally taken in by this man. Amen. But look what it what happens. It says sudden destruction will come. Sudden destruction will come upon them. Now in Daniel chapter I uh, didn't mean to get into uh, prophecy here tonight, uh, but let's 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 do this just for a short period of time. In Daniel uh, chapter nine and verse number twenty-seven, uh, we read uh, about this uh, this this pact that uh, the Antichrist will broker. Here's what it says in nine twenty-seven, Daniel nine and verse number twenty-seven, and he shall confirm that he is the Antichrist. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That one week means one year. That's prophetic talk. Uh, and in the midst of the week, that's the midst of the seven years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. Uh, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's a, that's, that's a lot, but here's, here's what it simply means. That he will he will make a contract or a covenant or he will have this agreement that will bring peace. However, at the midpoint of this seven year uh, peace uh, treaty, uh, he will break it. How will he break it? He will do exactly uh, as uh, Alexander the Great did before him. We know what Alexander the Great did. He went into the Jewish temple and he desecrated it. He, he killed a pig or pigs on the altar, the Jewish temple. And the Antichrist will do something similar to this. It's called the abomination of desolation or the abomination that causes desolation. Let me explain it again. What he will do will be an abominable thing and it will cause the Jews to disperse. The abomination that causes desolation. Okay? And that's what is going to happen. And that is part of the day of the Lord here that Paul is speaking about. Okay? But once again, sudden destruction is going to come. They're going to believe this man and he is going to turn on them. And it says, as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. They shall not escape. Those who don't know the Lord will not escape. Now, during the, t during the time of the tribulation, there will yet be Christians on earth. Like you say, how can that be if all the Christians went up uh, to heaven? Well, that's simply because the Holy Spirit will still be resident on earth. The Holy Spirit will still be here. And as long as the Holy Spirit is on earth, salvation is possible. Salvation is possible. He will still bring conviction. He, he will still do the work that he does. Uh, he, will, he will lead God, direct, reveal. He, he, the Holy Spirit will still be here. When the church goes, that does not preclude that the Holy Spirit will also go. Some believe that the Holy Spirit is gone also. No. The church goes. The Holy Spirit stays. The Holy Spirit is here. Amen. Let me go to Matthew chapter 24. And verse number 21. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 21. Speaking on these verses. It says, For then great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, nor shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Who are the elect? The elect is Israel. Okay? The elect is Israel. Now, we are also part of the elect, but he's speaking here about Israel. He says, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. In other words, Jesus will come after those three and a half years, and he will break through and rescue Israel. Amen? So it's going to be a difficult time. This is why. This is why we evangelize. This is why we this is why we pray that men and women get saved and give their heart to Jesus. Why? To avoid these things that are going to come upon planet Earth. 
Earth, the planet Earth, it is going to be a very, very difficult place to live during these times. And the only way that you can avoid what's going to be taking place on planet Earth is by being born again. When you're born again, you leave. Now, once again, people will get saved immediately following uh, the rapture. And, and throughout throughout the seven-year time, people are going to get saved because people are going to cry out to the Lord in sincerity. Lord, save me. There will be people who will realize what has happened and they will cry out to the Lord and the Lord will hear. There will be others uh, who, there are others right now today who are aware of the rapture. They have heard about it for their entire lives. But they they have, many have scoffed uh, and they don't believe it anymore because of all the different things that have taken place in the world and how could God let this happen and, and what's going on and it's not fair and God's not coming back and, and all that kind of, uh, all that kind of understanding. Let me read 2 Peter uh, chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3, starting in verse number 3. It says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Scoffers, and we will, we are living in that day right now. A scoffer is someone who makes light of biblical things. Someone who makes fun, pokes fun. Someone who tries to get other people not to believe. Someone who laughs at uh, those things that are biblical. In the last days scoffers shall come, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And so that will be the mindset. And that mindset has is beginning to take over now. Where is Jesus? Jesus is not coming. Look at all this happening. Why would Jesus allow all of these things to take place? It's just not fair. Where are you, Jesus? You're not really coming, are you? And, and, and that is the hope of the enemy. The enemy wants to take your faith and remove it away from faith in Christ and put it someplace else. Listen, trust me, and I know you may not know me uh, like you know other people, but listen, Jesus is coming back, okay? Jesus is coming back again. And when he comes, he is taking his church. Not everyone who is sitting in the church, that's not what I mean. Everyone who is born again, Everyone who is saved, everyone who has Jesus in their heart, he will take them away. He will take them away to be with him. We await that day. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen? Verse number four. He says, but you, brethren, once again, letting us know he's talking to Christians here. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. That, that that day should overtake you as a thief. No Christian, we should not be caught unaware. Are you looking for the coming of the Lord? Are you expecting the coming of the Lord? Do you know, do you understand that he can come at any moment? At any moment. I was walking outside today and I, I was un knowing what I was going to speak about tonight. I was looking up at the sky, and the sky today where we are is blue, not a cloud in the sky. Not a cloud. But that doesn't matter because the Bible says that Christ will come in the clouds. If it's a clear day, there's going to be a cloud that day, and he will come in the clouds. I don't know how it's going to happen except what Scripture says, that he is going to come in the air, in the air and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Just think about that. Think about what's going to happen on planet Earth. But he says, listen, you are not in darkness, okay? Uh, that, that day should overtake you as a thief. We should not be unaware. For the Christian, when it comes to prophetic events, these prophetic events that we're talking about tonight, and what we read in the book of Revelation, even though, the balance of the book of Revelation, we are not there. We will not be here on earth to experience the things that we read about in the book of Revelation. But we need to yet be aware and not be ignorant of these things. 
Amen. We need to be able to explain these things to those who don't know, to those who don't understand, to those who are searching, to those who are unsaved. He says, comfort one another with these words. These words are, are of importance because they speak of what will take place. And when we hear about what will take place, it should not cause us to shudder. It should not cause us to uh, quake and shake and become afraid and apprehensive. It should give us encouragement and comfort. The Lord is coming back. What does it say in uh, John? I believe it's John. Let me go there real quick. John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and verse uh, number 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. That's what Jesus says. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Oh, there's going to be some trouble in this world. While we're yet still here, before Jesus comes, there's going to be some trouble, some tribulation, some hard times uh, in this world. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. Get happy. Rejoice. He says, because I have overcome the world. And because he lives, we live. And because he was uh, victorious, we shall be victorious also. Amen? And so we need to rejoice. Verse number five, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. Christ is the light of the world and what comes from him is light. There's no darkness in him. We are his children and so we are the children of light. We are not of the night nor of darkness. The child of God is supposed to be different in this world. We carry ourselves. We have a, we have a different master. Amen? That's who we are. Verse number six. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We must overcome this attitude of apathy and lethargy. No, I don't know. I don't. No, not today. No, I don't. We have to overcome that. He says that we need to watch and and be sober. First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The enemy is on the prowl. He wants to swallow us up. We must be sober. Sober-minded. That means we need to be alert. We need to be watchful. Because he's out there and he wants to do all he can to take us out and move us away. Remember, we fight the fight of faith. He wants to destroy your faith. That's what the enemy wants uh, to do. Uh, most of all, destroy our faith. So once again, don't allow the world uh, to uh, not only contaminate you, but don't allow the world to intoxicate you with its wares. And don't allow the cares of this world to take your take your heart and your eyes off of Jesus. It's very easy for this to happen. The cares of this life, the things, the necessary things of this life that we need to do, our work, our job, the different things that happen in our families, all the different things that happen around us, the cares of this world can, can somehow wear us down. And we cannot allow this to happen. We must always keep our faith locked into Christ and who he is. That is where our victory is. So we need to keep awake. That's why he says, keep awake. Keep your mind alert, amen? Don't fall asleep spiritually. He's not so much talking about physical uh, soberness and getting drunk. He's using uh, he's using uh, the word drunk and sober as a way of, of telling us that we need to remain uh, in our right minds, amen? If When you get drunk, uh, something happens in your mind. I've never been drunk. But when you get drunk and when you get intoxicated, uh, it, it changes who you are. Your personality uh, changes. And so he's saying, avoid that spiritually. Don't allow the world to do this to you. Verse number seven. For they who sleep in the night 
and they who be drunk, they who for they who sleep in the night, and they who be drunken are drunken in the night. Amen. And so once again, avoid this spiritual condition of drunkenness, lethargy, apathy, laziness. Avoid it at all costs. Amen. There is work to be done. There is so much work to be done, and we need to be on our guard in order to carry it out. Verse number eight, but let us who are of the day be sober. Let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Faith and love. Remember, you will only be as strong as the object of your faith. Remember this. The object of your faith is so very important. In other words, where do you place your faith? What is the focus of your faith? Is it on your church? Is it on your pastor or bishop or leader? Where is your faith? Is your faith in Christ? He's the one who won our victory at the cross. That's where my faith should be, in the one who who died for me. Amen? That's where our faith belongs. He says here, putting on that breastplate of love, of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. We read in the book of Ephesians about the, the helmet of salvation. When we talk about the helmet, it's always, it always symbolically is speaking about uh, salvation. Amen? Always. And when we talk about salvation, uh, the next verse is going to speak to that. Verse number nine, for God has not appointed us to wrath. Once again, he's, he, he, makes, he makes the difference. He shows us the difference uh, since we've been speaking here from verse one to nine so far. He's talking about they, he's talking about others, and he's talking about we and us, okay? And so you need to know when he's speaking about everyone else and when he's speaking about us. Here, he says, God has not appointed us to wrath. He has not appointed us to wrath. God bless you, Nancy. God bless you. He has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. He has, he has uh, not appointed us to wrath. In other words, this great tribulation that we've been talking about tonight is not something that the child of God is meant to to experience we will not be here we will not experience the great tribulation once again the rapture takes care of that we are gone to heaven but what he has appointed us to is to obtain salvation and let me just say in passing here that our salvation uh we have a threefold salvation threefold salvation you say once again what are you talking about here is our threefold salvation. Number one, we are saved. Right now, at this very moment, you don't need to question it. You don't need to wonder about it. If you've given your heart to Jesus, you are saved. Number two, and scripture bears this out. I don't have all the scriptures here with me tonight, but scripture bears this out. We are saved. Secondly, we are being saved. Scripture tells us that we are being saved. This is that process of sanctification that we talk about from time to time. Daily, we are being saved. We are saved. Don't get me wrong when I say we are being saved. We are saved. But once again, it's that sanctification process that we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate Christian goal. Remember that. The ultimate Christian goal is to be like Jesus. That's our goal. We're not there yet. We're still striving to be more like Jesus. And then thirdly, the third phase of our salvation is our ultimate salvation. So we are saved. We are being saved. That is becoming more and more like Christ. And thirdly, we will be saved. And that will take place when we meet the Lord in the air. The Bible says that we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That's the rapture. It's at that moment that we will be changed and we will be like Christ. Now, one more thing. When we say like Christ, we will not be Christ. 
in eternity. We will not be Christ in eternity, but once again, sin will be gone. Sin nature will be gone. Everything about us now that causes you heartache, gone, gone, okay? And that, once again, will be our ultimate salvation. We will be truly saved. We are truly saved now, but truly saved in this sinful, corrupted body. Corruption shall put on incorruption, and mortality shall put on immortality. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I believe we went into that last week. But so God has not appointed us to be a part of the great tribulation. He has better things waiting for us in heaven. Amen. Verse number 10, who died for us, that whether we, we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. Once again, that's a reference to the rapture that we spoke about in chapter number four. Whether we are awake, alive when he remain, when he comes, or sleep, whether we are dead and he will take us with him. Either way, <coughs> either way, you are going to be with the Lord in the air. Either way, if we pass away now, we're going to be with him. If we, if we are alive when he comes, we're going to be with him. Mm. When I think about it, 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 it sort of give me, gives me, uh, uh, I don't know how to say this, sort of spiritual uh, goosebumps. Just, just knowing, just knowing the future is, is the future is, is powerful. The future is great because we know that we are going to be with Jesus for eternity. Think about that now. Eternity. Not for we're going to live with Jesus for like a hundred years or maybe a thousand years or a couple of thousand years or a couple of million years or a couple of billion years as we understand years. We're going to be with Jesus forever. Forever. It just forever. Don't Think about that word forever too long. It gives you sort of a headache. But we're going to be with him for always. We look forward to that day. We look forward to that day. Verse number 11. Wherefore, he says, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. There's no time. We don't have time to scratch and claw and argue and fight over nothing. We don't have time for this. Yes, your personality is different than my personalities and the things that you like are different than the things that I like and, and we're all different. That's the beauty of it. We're all different. We're not all going to be alike and like the same things. We're not. We are not. Listen, I've been married for a whole bunch of years, 41 years, and me and my wife are just as opposite as you can get. Opposite. My my wife is outgoing. I am not so outgoing. You may think I'm outgoing, but I'm not that outgoing. I'm shy. I'm pretty much to myself. She is more outgoing. She is truly my better half. This is this is 100% sure. I like to watch sports. She doesn't want to see a basketball, a baseball, football, a hockey stick. She doesn't want to see anything. We are totally opposite. But what we do have in common, we love Jesus. We love Jesus. And so we bless the Lord. We can, listen, he, he says, listen, don't bother yourselves with things that don't matter. Think about the end times. In other words, think about the fact that we are going to be living in heaven forever, together, with no problems with one another. That's not possible. There's not going to be any conflict in heaven. Uh, her room is bigger than my room, and, and this is better than, and she has more gifts than I do, and she has more rewards than I do. It's not going to be any of that in heaven. None of that. None, none, none. And so let's begin now, as we are here to edify one another, to comfort one another with these words. Listen, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to make everything all right. When we get there, it will be all right. Amen? It will be absolutely all right. We look forward to that day that Jesus is coming back. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
That's what we're going to have. We don't have that in this world right now. We can have that type of peace in our hearts. Jesus says, my peace I live with, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Don't worry about what the world is doing and what it does. The world has its own way. The world knows and the world, as scripture says, the world loves its own. You are not of the world. You and I are not of the world. And if the world does not love us, we're doing something right. If the world looks at you and says, you're crazy, you're insane, you're ridiculous, you don't know what you're doing, what's all this Jesus stuff, you don't, if the world has that attitude toward what you do in your ministry or your preaching or whatever, if that's what the world says, mm -hmm. thank you, Lord. I'm doing something right. I'm doing something right. Amen. But when you get accolades from the world, I'm not talking about from the church, family. I'm talking about when you get accolades from the world, the world is patting you on your back. Good job. Good job. Oh, yeah. Oh, good, good. Watch out. Watch out. Dagger coming. Dagger coming. The world is not supposed to hear the message of the gospel and say, oh, that's good. I like that. There must have been something in it that must have... Uh, it, it, it. The Bible says that the gospel is going to bring conflict. And not that we intentionally are looking for conflict because we are not. We are not looking intentionally for conflict at all. I'm going to go out here and preach this gospel so I can make somebody mad. No. No, no, no. But if you preach the gospel, if you preach this truth, people are either going to be drawn to it or they're going to be repelled by it. And some will be convicted and they won't respond right away. Others will seem as if I don't hear it. I don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't mean anything to me. Leave it, drop it, and leave it with God. That's all you can do. That's all we're called to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. That's all we're called to do. And so don't give up. Comfort yourselves together. Edify one another, even as also you do. Amen. We're going to stop right there. When we come together next week, we're going to start in verse number 12. And hopefully, uh, we'll probably maybe finish uh, the balance of this chapter. We'll see. Uh, but we'll start in verse number 12 when we come together next week. I want to pray. Because anytime I talk about uh, end time events, uh, it's always a time uh, to talk about those who may not know the Lord. Because once again, I repeat, these things that we've spoken about tonight, in brief, they are coming upon the world. These things are coming upon the world. They are going to happen. Amen? They are going to happen. And if someone is listening, someone is watching, wherever you are, if you don't know the Lord, if you've listened tonight, if you've watched tonight, and this sounds like science fiction, Sounds like Star Trek, Star Wars. It sounds like something out of a, out of uh, out of nowhere. This is real. This is coming from the Holy Bible. And these things are real, and they are going to take place in the near future, as we understand prophecy. Near <laughs> can mean within months, days, weeks, or years. But these things will take place. We believe. I believe. In my lifetime, and I'm moving up quick, I'm moving up, but I still believe uh, that these things will take place, begin to take place in my lifetime, amen? And if not my lifetime, surely in our children or grandchildren's lifetime, these things are going to take place, amen? And so we need to be ready. I'm ready because I'm in Christ. Are you ready? Amen? If you don't know the Lord, pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, Forgive me of my sin. I have sensed your spirit tonight. Lord, forgive me. Lord, your word declares, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I shall be saved. Lord, I thank you for what you have done in my life. Help me to live for you from now on. In Jesus' name.
Amen and amen. Well, hallelujah. We bless the name of the Lord. If you prayed that prayer, uh, let us know. Drop us a line at our website at that's the word, uh, dot org. Amen. Just let us know and we'll send you out some things that will help you uh, to continue on uh, living uh, this Christian life. Amen. We want to be uh, we want to be a, a help. Uh, we want to be a help uh, to uh, the child of God. Uh, the If you're searching, uh, if you're looking, you found Jesus tonight. Amen. And Jesus is the answer to all that you need. Amen. Well, we just bless the Lord. I'm going to make sure that you join us on tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we're going to continue uh, our week of ministry uh, as we continue going through the word of God uh, tomorrow night, uh, you can join us for our series entitled The Times in our in our podcast, The Bible Speaks Live. Uh, we're examining the state of this present world in the light of scripture. And tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about repentance. Repentance. It's time to repent. We're going to be talking about that. If you know someone uh, who is not a Christian, if you know someone who is not saved, uh, and we're going to be talking about repentance. Uh, we all need repentance. The, the child of God and those who don't know the Lord definitely need that. And so invite someone uh, to listen tomorrow night. We'll be here at 8.30. Uh, it's time to repent. Wednesday night, uh, we're going to continue uh, with our first principles uh, session, uh, basic discipleship for the growing believer, and we're going to be continuing uh, and actually concluding probably concluding our uh, talk on uh, the Holy Spirit. We're going to finish out talking about uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and then we're going to uh, branch out and talk about what we can do that will offend the Holy Spirit, things that we don't want to do to the Holy Spirit, amen? Because remember, the Holy Spirit is a person, amen? And so we don't want to do anything that's going to hurt, diminish, or violate him. So join us on Wednesday night. Amen. So we pray that you will continue uh, to pray, uh, that you will continue to pray for us. Uh, don't forget uh, that you can find uh, all of our podcasts streaming on some of the following uh, podcast platforms. We're on many others, but we just put these here uh, just to let you know we are there. Uh, our main podcast platform is Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform where you'll find all of our podcasts that's the home of our, all of our podcasts uh that the lord has allowed us to produce over the years amen you can also go uh, to our youtube channel and become a subscriber to our channel if you have not done so already amen uh you can also go uh back to our website and and while there you can download a free copy of our ebook entitled remaining unmovable uh, seven quality keys to longevity in Christ. Amen. These resources are meant to build you up in your Christian faith. Amen. We pray <clears throat> that you will take advantage of these resources. Amen. So that will do it for tonight. I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, God bless you. Uh, God bless you, Debbie. God bless you, Nancy, and all those uh, who will be watching uh, later on. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Uh, don't forget to join us tomorrow night for The Bible Speaks Live. Amen. Until then, I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. We'll see you next time. May God bless you.